One moment. What's up, everybody? Lamont Hill, owner of Uncle Bobby's Coffee and Books, and welcome to yet another book event that we're having. As you know, we have moved from the physical space to the online space, which is actually pretty dope because we get to not just have conversations with you in Philadelphia, but now we get to have conversations with authors and with uh, book readers all around the world. So tonight we have yet another amazing author. This is a brother who I've known for a long time, someone who I deeply respect, uh, someone who I appreciate. He's a friend. Uh, and he is now a memoir writer. <laughs> <laughs> His, the book is called My Vanishing Country, a memoir, Bakari Seller, CNN contributor. Uh, are you the youngest, by the way, are you the youngest person elected to? I was back in the day. I mean, I, I was the youngest black elected official. I, 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 my, my, I think the history book still stand in South Carolina, the youngest black elected official in South Carolina, youngest state legislator, all that other stuff. But let me just say, um, before we get too far in, man, thank you. Uh, Mark, thank you, Uncle Bobby's. Um, you know, even when Uncle Bobby's went down during this time, you were never out. I reached out to you, and and you know, you were able to facilitate uh, book buys and do everything, man. I'm just so grateful for all your support um, and your guidance, man. And and I will tell you that without, I tell people this: without books like Nobody, without books like uh, anything Michael Larry Tyson wrote, without the other Westmore. I, this book wouldn't be in existence. There would be no publisher that would want to sign us. So thank you for pushing, man. And thank you for having me here. No, it's my pleasure, man. And I got word today, and I, I think I texted you earlier, that your book is once again on the New York Times bestseller list uh, and went up. It was 15. Now it's number 10. And it's climbing, man. And and I, it's, I was looking at the, uh, I think I'm allowed to tell people who's on the list. Sure, there, sure. There was some folk uh, who moved up the list. The number one book in America uh, this week is Ibram Kendi. Uh, it's the number one book on the, the, this weekend's New York Times bestseller list. You got on the on the paperback list, it's uh, uh, White Fragility. Brittany Cooper's Eloquent Rage made the a book yeah. several years ago is on the list for the first time this week. So there's something going on in America that you makes- You know what that means though, Mark? No, you know what it means? Yeah. And it means we need to make this push for nobody to come back. <laughs> That's what it- I ain't worried about me, man. I, I want to read y'all books because they're, they're so important. And, you know, the question, one of the things I ask people all the time in the last five years has been so many interesting memoir, memoirs. Darnell Moore's uh, No Ashes in the Fire, Kiese Lehman's Heavy. Heavy. Uh, which is, you know, both amazing books. Um, Kiese, that, that, that for me is, is one of the most important memoirs. I think America. Heavy, heavy, I think, heavy, I think, is the best. I mean, it's the best memoir that I've ever read. I mean, I, and I say that, and, and I love memoirs. I mean, I, I, I really do. I love people telling their own story. Um, you know, Andre Leon Talley wrote an amazing book just yes. recently. It came out the same, you know, his struggles being, being from the South and going to Paris and I mean, all of that. But Heavy was a special, special book. And I'm just, you know, to be on a list like that, I laugh and I'm like, you know, I'm the, I'm the first, um, I'm the first New York Times bestseller from Denmark, South Carolina. <laughs> 3,000 people. And it's a, you know, it's three stoplights and a blinking light. But, um, and you know, yeah, yeah. But, you know, it, it, it is what it is. And so I, I make, I'm really excited about it and, and excited about what's to come. Yeah, man. Why, why a memoir? I mean, a lot of people would have expected you to write a, 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 a reflection on what's yeah. wrong with the party of, 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 of Lincoln and why they're wrong or why your own party needs to move in a different direction or who should run for president. They want some of that, that trenchant political analysis. You did something different. Why? I tried to do that. I tried to do that. That was the craziest thing. I tried to write the political book. I mean, I'll just share it with y'all, my closest friends. Uh, who were watching here at Uncle Bobby's? It, it was amazing. I, I got turned down nearly thirty times for this book. I mean, I, I remember talking to you about just the process, but um, it was uh, Kevin Powell introduced me to Tracy Sherrod, who is over the Amistad imprint at Harper Collins, mm. a black woman. And I even helped somebody. I even paid somebody to help me put together a proposal, and people were tearing the proposal up. <laughs> We still here? Everybody good? Yeah. Oh, I'm about as technologically savvy as, <laughs> as savvy as any 35 million, 35 year old millennial in the, in the world. Um, but no, and and she brought me in. She she said, Bakari, we want we want to hear more of your story. Tell me who you are. And I was like, you know, the most amazing thing is that I told her about Orangeburg. I told her about Charleston. I told her about my troubles actually writing this political book. And you'll find this funny. I, I Kaylee McEnany, who was a good friend of mine at the time. You know, Kaylee is. 
you know how CNN friendships go. So when I say good friends, I don't want people, you know, throwing all types of tomatoes at me. But Kaylee and I, after our hits, would go over to, to the little sushi bar across the street from the studio and, and grab some sushi. And she was telling me about her book deal. She got $150,000 for her book deal. And so I talked to Tracy Sherrod and I said, you know, one of the things um, that I want is I, I want a book deal. I want $150,000 and $1. Because I want <laughs> I wanted more than Kaylee McEnany. They didn't give me that. But, 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 you know, for me, I wanted the opportunity to tell my story. I didn't think anybody wanted to hear me. But as we know, it took a black woman um, putting some pouring into me and, and putting her faith in me and saying that you should write this book for this, you know, for, for whatever moment it was. You never imagine you putting a book out during a pandemic. You never imagine that you won't be able to go on a book tour. You know, I was hoping to be able to be at Uncle Bobby's and hoping to be able to go on TV shows. But, you know, now I'm doing Zoom events with basketball shorts on, right? Not, <laughs> even, putting on, not even putting on pants to do events. And this book just happened to be, it's fate. Um, this book happened to be on time. And so let me just, I know I'm rambling, but let me just put a point on it. There are people who are watching who never felt like they had the time to complete something. And let me just say that God has given you nothing but time now. He has us all locked at the house, so you have nothing but time. And I wrote this book. And, you know, I sat down every day for a minimum of 15 minutes a day. 15 minutes a day to put, put this together. And I had to rush because everybody wanted me to have this book completed and out before the fall because Barack Obama's book comes out this fall. Right. And, that's, you know, that's like when they remake albums back in, de in December, back in the time, nobody wanted a record near it. Like, listen, when Drake put albums out right now, you got to change your release date. And so that's exactly what we wanted to do. And so nobody believed in it, but Tracy did. And now we are here with some success and we're going to keep pushing. We don't want it to stop. We're going to keep pushing. When people write memoirs, different things are centered for them. Uh, one thing that's centered for you, one of the key things in your memoir that, that I found resonant was that this idea of place. Um, and how central certain locations are for you, whether it's Morehouse, whether it's, yeah. you know, but let's start with Denmark. Yeah, Denmark is my home. It's three stoplights and a blinking light. It's where we didn't even know we were poor. It's where Denmark is like every other, it's like, it's like every other rural Southern town, but also like black communities throughout the country. Cause I'm pretty sure even in Philly, you had an icy lady, like a, a, a woman whose house you went to where she either sold you little candies, a little icy, a little goods. You had the church folk, church, especially the church ladies with the big hats that sat on the front two rows. Um, you had the dudes who sat at the barbershop who um, they were never there to get a haircut, but they would tell you how Sonny Liston and his prom could beat Mike Tyson. Right. Um, and they remember when King came through town, they always had this wisdom. And so I wanted to lift up all those voices. You know, I wanted to lift up those voices of the lady who made the really good pies um, because she used two sticks of butter. Um, you know, I wanted to, to just um, give back to and, and I didn't want it to be patronizing um, because those people have given me so much. And so I'm excited about I'm excited about the product. I'm excited about the place because Denmark for me is home. You know, there 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 can be a lot of places where you live, but there's only one home. Right. And Denmark for me will always be home. Another place that resonates in the book and in your life is Greensboro. Yeah. Well, Greensboro was where I was born and Greensboro was where my father was sent to sent off to, as we call it. After my father was after my father left prison, he went to he went to Greensboro and um, they accepted us and they accepted my father. And my mother had to work extremely hard. Um, you know, my father, um, through education at, at uh, UNCG, um, got a doctorate, got his master's from Harvard. My, my father had to navigate with a felony on his record. My father was a felon for rioting. He's the first and only one man riot in the history of this country. Um, Greensboro gave us um, a semblance of hope. You know, um, that's where all of us were born, um, and that's where my father my father had to go to find refuge when he when he was excommunicated, for lack of a better term, from South Carolina. Look, I, I want to talk a little bit more about your father because your father. I mean, all of us have fathers that loom in the background or in the foreground of our lives. It's in our psyche. If they weren't there, it matters. If they were there, it matters. But your relationship to your father is particularly interesting, not just because you look like him, 
but because your your your, your political trajectory and your personal trajectory is very much tied to his work and and his journey. You, you come out of what what some would say civil rights royalty. Uh, I'm I'm a child of the movement, you know, and it's a it's a it ain't a big club, and I tell people that. Um, you know, something that I I get away with saying I think. Um, if you go down south, particularly, you, you count out 10 black folk. All 10 of them would say you had a march with King, but less than one of them was actually there. Um, true. <laughs> it's funny because I heard somebody um, yesterday on, on, on I was I was listening in to Chuck Todd on MSNBC and somebody said that they helped found SNCC. And I was like, nah, you weren't you weren't there. You weren't there. Uh, but it's cool. It's cool now. You know, SNCC, my, my dad, when uh, he wasn't one of the founders, but he joined. He joined because of a young man named Stokely Carmichael. And they were they were roommates at Howard. Stokely graduated from Howard, convinced my dad to drop out of school. They went to Miami University of Ohio. I can't read. I can't wait to read the book about Miami University of Ohio. It plays a very integral role in our civil rights history. That's where they train workers for Freedom Summer. And some of the workers that were trained there were Goodman, Schroeder, and Chaney. Yes. And my father, who had an Afro, had a beard like mine was skinny like me, had an Afro beard in mind, right? Now. He was the one who led the search mission to go and look for um, Goodman, Turner, and Cheney in Philadelphia, Mississippi. I always challenge people, I'm like, have you ever been to Philadelphia? And the crowd will raise their hand. I'm like, no, 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 Mississippi. You know, it's the size of the conference room. Wherever I'm speaking, it's always the size of the conference room. And they, during the day, they would hide, hide in barns and sheds. At night, they would go out and look in ditches and trenches. And ironically enough, they found their home behind the home of one of the local sheriff's deputies and ministers in the town. Um, that's how entrenched that wickedness and evil was in, in Philadelphia. And, um, you know, that was my father's first indoctrination into the movement. And his story is my story. Um, politically, yeah, I always joke with him because I tell him I'm the only person in the family to win an election. He did run for city council. <laughs> turn out. But he was, he was regional field director for uh, Jesse Jackson, for Uncle Jesse, um, in 84 and 88. My dad hired people like Donna Brazil mm. um, on the campaign. And so, um, yeah, I am I am someone who, even with all my faults, and even with, uh, as I'm attempting to matriculate and learn more, um, try to continue the journey that he was going on. The, I don't want to say too much in Greensboro, but the Greensboro massacre, you know, there's a way that you talk about how it's mattered to you and how- Orange Road Massacre, Orange Road Massacre, yeah. Orange, excuse me, thank you. Uh, I, I mattered to you, but, and that it stays in your psyche and that it, 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 you, it may matter too much to you, you, you talk about. And, yeah, no, and, and that's cool because people, because the Orange Road Massacre, because Greensboro and Orange Road both are centered with HBCUs, that's, that's the unique part. I mean, the Orange Road Massacre is something that happened on the campus of South Carolina State. And it's it's wild because three black people were killed and nobody knows the story. 28 black people were shot by law enforcement. It's the first time law enforcement officers were brought up on federal charges for shooting black people, federal civil rights charges. They were all found not guilty, but they were the first time it was brought up. And we know about Kent State. Yeah. People even know about Jackson a little bit. But um, for me, it was it, it's very hard because I want more people to know about, I want more people to know about, about Orange. And that's why I wrote about it. And it is the most important part of my, my life, the most important day of my life, even though it was 16 years before I was born. Yeah. Um, you know, my father, for me, is a hero. And just like, you know, when we grow up with fathers in our lives and, and um, the work they do, um, you, you want to be like them. And for me, that was a, that was a moment of social justice, and I want to be like him. So you wanted to be like him. You again, you got Martin Luther King in the backdrop. He he performed his first his first uh, a, 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 a wedding ceremony. You got Uncle Julian, Uncle Stokely. You got you got this whole rich tradition, and then you go to Morehouse College. And w tell me why, first of all, what, what what was the significance of that? Was it just to follow King? Was it was it because? No. It was my brother went to Morehouse first, and I went to. I was a basketball player. I thought. <laughs> uh, my first of all, I'm still. I, I am still a lifetime fitness MVP and all star. <laughs> Before anybody thinks they can try me in hoops, just know that at lifetime fitness, I actually won the MVP two seasons ago. I'm a perennial all star. But <laughs> my brother, my brother had me come up there, man, 
and it was summer and I, I was sitting on the strip. Ah, that, that's all you had to say. <laughs> yeah. And it was Clark and it was Spellman and everything. And I, I was I was hooked. That's why I went. Uh, my choices were Columbia, um, uh, Howard and Morehouse. Mm. My three choices. Armand Hill was the coach at Columbia at the time. And he recruited me to play basketball there. They were coming off of two and 23 and one and some crazy season. I went down to Morehouse and Uncle Julian went to Morehouse. And I always tell people, I'd rather be a Julian Bond than Barack Obama. Like, I, I just, I, I always, that is my, that's been, I, I told Julian that I was in his uh, explorations of black leadership, um, which was it, this, this amazing uh, uh, video um, collection, video library that he did uh, of black leaders. So if anybody has a chance, just go and Google it and it comes up. And he does these long form interviews with a lot. I'm one of the last ones once he did when I was a young state legislator. And I said, you know, I, Uncle Julian, I'd rather be considered you than Barack Obama because of how he was rooted in the struggle. And, it, and I love 44. I know I know we have our political differences on 44. But I, I just I just um, I just found the fact that his frame of reference was vastly different and his cultural experiences were vastly different. And the things he, the, the type of change, the type of fight, people forget that Julian Bond, they tried to eject him from the Georgia State Senate, right? They didn't even want him in the Georgia State Senate because of his stance on Vietnam, right? And he won these battles. And I write about it, and I, I tell people all the time. I, one of the one of the more controversial pieces in my book that nobody has written about or picked up on is when I highlight the the election between Julian Bond and John Lewis. Yes, in the book. And you know, I I, I write a line in there that you know I, I firmly believe that had there been a, a you know a different type of campaign run that. Um, Julian Bond would have been the congressman from that district. And so, um, you know, these people, they, you know, uh, the age old African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. They were a part of my village. So you get to Morehouse and, you know, what happens? How, how, a couple of things happen. One, the, the whole, we, we, we don't even got to talk about the walk on thing. I, what, what, <laughs> what, else, what else happens? Uh, what you want to know the walk on thing you want to know the you want to know the time I, I got arrested on Spelman's campus for uh, actions and becoming of a Morehouse man for, for staying over there too long. See, this is it. This is this is the stuff that I think people need to understand, because when people hear the journey from, you know, civil rights baby to <laughs> commentator and politician, they don't understand that in the middle of all of that was a journey that's not that different than every everybody other. else's journey. No. And you know, I, even even in the Morehouse chapters, I tell stories about uh, Samuel L. Jackson that people don't know. Yeah. Not only, you know, Samuel Samuel took an involuntary hiatus from, <laughs> they made from Morehouse. Uh, you know, he not only marched behind um, King's casket, but he did. He he uh, he had to leave and re, re uh, regather his thoughts for a period of time. Let's just say that. So when you read it, you'll you'll get a kick out of that. Um, you know, in Morehouse, I ran for SJ president. I ran against I ran for SJ president against some cool people like Lee Merritt. We called him Stacy. I had to change it in my book because you know in college people have you know different names, but Stacy Merritt, Lee Merritt, um, who it now represents um, Ahmad's family, Brianna's family, and uh, George Floyd's family. I ran against very well known comedians like uh, Clark Jones. I mean, I, it was it was it was amazing, and I and I won. Then they took it from me. I had to win again, and so I had to win four races. It was my first little kind of indoctrination into into politics. And I tell people, people are like, politics and Morehouse was serious on. I'm like, yeah. It's like, you know, being SJ president is like being the quarterback at Texas or, you know, Clemson. That's and when you look at the folk who have done it, even look at like Sean King. I mean, there's a lot there's a lot of people who have been SJ president who we in the world know as somebody precisely right. because of okay. what the, the mayor of Birmingham, Randall Wolfen, was SJ president. I mean yeah. So yeah, I, and and there there are a lot of young. I have to remind myself, like this is my fifteenth year since graduating. I, I feel like I'm getting out now. You older than me, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> to be clear, but I, uh, you know, I, I just want to. I want to. I want to. There are a lot of young people who are still doing great work who are still coming from that university. So when you get out, you know, a lot of people want to make a lot of money before they um, run for any kind of political office that's going to be long-term. You know, if you run for state house, you run for Congress, U.S. Congress, 
you, you, you're going to be there for 20, 30 years sometimes if you're in the right district. You know, it, so a lot of people say, you know, what, I want to make some money and then run in case I end up staying. I don't want to spend the rest of my life not having, you know, made the big, big money. What made you what made you say? Because, you know, a lot of politicians, you know, a whole lot of folk that are connected. You knew what was at stake. What made you say, you know what? I'm young. I'm in my 20s and I'm going to run for the I'm gonna run for, for statewide office. People ask me what type of courage did you have? And I say it was insanity. It wasn't courage at all. <laughs> um, but there are two things. One, I tell people that you need to run for office when you're really young or you need to run for office when your family is set and situated. I, and I think that I was able to because people ask me this question often and I, that that was the balance because I didn't have a family. Right. You cannot go into politics and want to have a lifestyle. You cannot go into politics and want to maintain a family because that's just it's it's really not possible. I, I'm somebody who believes you need to pay your your elected officials more. Uh, and I don't you know, I don't know how much people are getting paid in some of the larger cities. But my salary as a South Carolina state representative was ten thousand six hundred dollars a year. And, you know, the same you pay for what you get. Right. Yeah. So who, who was elected? Old, retired white folk. Either you are already retired or independent with independently wealthy people with good jobs who had good common sense, who would be good elected officials, couldn't afford to do it. And so for me, I was in law school and I told myself I was going to be elected eight years, 10 years. I stayed eight years. I ran for lieutenant governor after eight years. It was the best experience I ever had. I always tell people it was weird because LeBron James and me and LeBron are equal caliber basketball players and so yeah, you're, you're the lebron james of life fitness <laughs> and so what i would what i would tell people is that lebron james and i had the coolest jobs of any x year old because we were the same age in the country um and my job was so cool because i got to change people's lives i encourage people people watching and want to see the change around them go run go run for office be the change you want to see being it's an interesting move because statewide elections are hard for black folk to win in the South, they're special. The South. And you talk about this in the book. T tell me why, how are you able to, to challenge that? And, and, and why can't more people be successful? Because it seems to me that you, you laid out a blueprint. Well, we, and I'm, I'm honestly glad you acknowledge that. I mean, I ran in 2014 and, and I tell people all the time I was young, I was black, I was a Democrat. And my fourth strike was I was a young black Democrat, right? <laughs> I, ran it, I, ran, I ran for statewide office and I tried to be the first black elected official statewide since 1876 in South Carolina. Ooh. 1876 was reconstruction. The weird part about that, the weird part about that was that um, two black folk were running against each other in 1876. One Democrat, one Republican. <laughs> the Republican won, of course. Cool. Uh, and that was and that was that was unique at that time. And so I wanted to throw history on its head. That was part of the attractiveness. And I got 41, 42 percent of the vote, which was good. But after me came Andrew Gillum and after me came Stacey Abrams and they've been able to chip away at it. And so maybe just maybe we'll have Jamie Harrison. Maybe we'll have Ralph Warnock. But I'm just glad to be a part of a group of people that chipped away at that class. At, at the current moment, and, and I want to I want to talk to you about a little bit about some of the other things. There's at least one more thing I want to talk about with you. Actually, let me, let me go there first, because sure. uh, you this is a, a memoir and I, and I don't want people to think that this is just you telling the story of of Bakari Sellers. It, it's so much deeper than that. It's memoir. It's also cultural and ana social analysis. It's cultural criticism. And one of the interesting places you go um, that I find important is this question of mental health. Oh, yeah. Because, again, people tell me, particularly when politicians and TV personalities give memoirs, they're often victory narratives. It's like, I'm awesome, here's how I got this awesome. And if you do what I do, you'll be just as awesome as me, right? Or it's the opposite, it's completely tragic, right? It's completely tragic and melodramatic. I lived on the street for 20 years, you find out they did, you know, and, and, and this is neither, this is nuanced in, in a way that I appreciate. Talk to me about mental health for you um, and these conversations around anxiety and other things, but also how that speaks to the broader social issue. So for me, it was important to tell my truth, man. And I think, I mean, honestly, one of the one of the things, there are two things I give the Donald Trump presidency credit for. This is not Donald Trump himself. That they might be incidental, but in this time frame, authenticity is a plus amongst elected officials. Yeah. And we're having conversations about race we otherwise would not be having. So those are the two things. And when I wrote this, I said, you know, I was 31, 32, 33 when I started writing. I'm going to be completely honest. And 
anxiety is something that's very big in my life. It's a, it, it plays a role in my life and yeah. it's a part of me. I, and Yana Benzant talks about the fact that anxiety is, because I call it being stuck in my head. She said, it's when you're, when you're in your head with no supervision. Mm. Um, and so I, for me, I, I just, I wanted people to know that I am someone who has a beautiful family. You see me on CNN. I've been the youngest black elected official in the country, but I suffer from anxiety too. I have these fears. They call them irrational fears, but whatever. For me, it's a fear of death and a fear of failure. And I utilize those fears as my superpower. People ask me questions that stump me. This is a question that stumps me. What are you going to do in five, to, five years or 10 years? Anxiety prevents me from answering that question. Wow. And so I can only tell you what I can make, I can do in the next 24 hours. Like I try to make the most of these moments because of my fear and paranoia. But maybe not paranoia, my fear. But it makes me it makes me make the most of the time that I have. What are the best tools you've learned to use to manage that? Communication, man. And my wife being a partner. Um, I'm a firm believer, hopefully, um, because of the success of this book and hopefully we can keep it going. I want to write a book with uh, write a book with my wife. Um, and um, um, you know, I I communicating with her about many issues. You know, most black men think the only therapist you should go to is the barber, all right? Yes. But, I, you know, I think that we have to learn how to be more, because if you're not healthy mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, then you ain't no good to this movement, right? You, if you're broken, you can't you can't effectuate change. And so I'm learning. And, and a lot of things I write, I tell people often, I mean, a lot of things I say and write, I am aspirational, truly. Um, because I'm not there yet. I don't want anybody to think that my journey's over. I don't want anybody to think that every word in this book I've, I've actually accomplished. Some of these things I'm talking about are truly aspirational. The journey I'm on in my personal life. And I think that it's important for people to be on those journeys as well. I want to say a couple names. Tell me what comes to mind. Some are in the book, some aren't. Uh, Pop. You know, I don't know if Pop is watching this, but I... Um, I want Pop to know he's a success, a success because Pop and the hard work he's gone through, um, literally coming from the other side of the tracks, right? But the hard work that he's going through, going through, will make it easier for another generation. Um, I live for Pop every day. He's my brother, truly. Your mother, working on a relationship that's better than it used to be. My mother's been through a lot, and I think that my downfall with my mother is I did not acknowledge her contributions, not just to the movement, but to the, to the perseverance of our family. When you grow up in a family with a civil rights hero, like my father, sometimes that overshadows the true hero in the family. And my mother had to keep that together. And many of her mental health issues that I lay out in the book um, are stem from her sacrifices that she made. And I don't think I was mature enough or old enough or smart enough or wise enough, respectful enough to give those achievements and those issues she was dealing with the necessary credence and necessary value. And so now that's one of, that's part of my journey hmm. to lift her up. Jared. Shit, humbling. Uh, <laughs> you gotta have that friend around you that's all, you got those boys around you that, that just keep you humble. Oh yeah. Um, Jared is my best friend even today. We got some new announcements coming out this, this week, next week about some of the things we're doing, just keep building a brand, continuing to speak the truth to power. Um, I love, he's the godfather of my kids. I talk to Jared every day um, and Jared is is dope. And we, the best way to describe Jared is we're figuring out this black fatherhood thing. I mean, you you have a teenager, maybe you can tell me because this teenage life is. <laughs> I'm still figuring it out myself, brother. It's different, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Um, Joe Biden. So Joe Biden, I feel like we could be multifaceted. I don't even think I mentioned Joe Biden's name in the book. But you know, I said something not in the book. Oh, I was like, did I mention Joe? No, you ain't mentioned Joe. I don't think Joe. Uh, yeah, you know what I tell people is that black people are smart enough to push Joe Biden to be better and still work like hell to make sure he's elected. So don't tell me I got to choose. Uh, that's that's what I hate. I hate when people are like, oh man, you can't you can't be out here trying to criti be critical of Joe Biden. What? Are you serious right now? I mean, I'm going to work like hell to get Joe Biden elected, and I'm going to be critical of him. I can do both. Donald Trump. Symptom, not problem. We've been racist before Donald Trump. We're going to be racist after Donald Trump. 
I'm I am amazed at how low they they how low they lowered the bar, the standard to be president of the United States after Barack Obama. Barack Obama had to be editor in chief of the Harvard Law Review to be president. And now we got this white boy who can't put together sentences. As is America. It's, I'm, I'm gonna be selfish and indulge you on, on your expert analysis for a second before I go. And by the way, if you're out there, for all the people out there watching, um, please write in your questions. Uh, any questions could be submitted on the right bar uh, and I'll make sure uh, we get to them. Also, uh, if you wanna buy, purchase a copy of Bakari's book, there's a green bar that says, buy my vanishing country. That will allow you to purchase the book right now. That link will also allow you to purchase it from us, uh, an independent black bookstore. Um, Vice President, there's been a lot of conversation about who the Vice President should be. Joe Biden has already promised us that his nomin his choice for the VP will be a woman. Uh, should it be a black woman? And if so, who? It should be a black woman. Let me tell you why, though, because there are a lot of people who are like, Joe Biden has the black vote lot locked up. And there's an element of truth to that in saying that black folk will still vote for him. My mama still vote for him. The difference is, if it's a black woman, then my mama's going to stand up in church every Sunday announcing that as soon as she's announced. My mama's going to make sure the church fans gassed up. My mama's going to be calling all her sorority sisters. She's going to be going out, picking up all her cousins and nieces and nephews. Naked. So it's the difference between them voting for you and them being activated. And so if you want us activated, it needs to be a black woman. I think that Kamala Harris is a layup right now. She's already been through the scrutiny of, of a nationwide election. She can debate. I mean, we, we know that. I mean, if she's not chosen, we can actually trace back to the fact that she was such a good debater in Miami as the reason why she probably, that she wouldn't be chosen. Um, Val Demings is, is someone they're talking about. But I honestly think that the black women who were probably remaining on the, on the, the, the higher echelon of, of that are uh, um, Kamala Harris and Susan Rice. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, Governor Luan Grisham out of uh, New Mexico is um, uh, a, a dark, dark horse long shot, um, as well as uh, maybe Tammy Baldwin. And how confident are you that it will be a black woman? I know you said it should be. Will it be? How, wh wh what's, your, what's your best guess? Man, I don't have a whole lot of faith. I mean, I, I'm hopeful. I, I think that there are people around him that suggest it. I think I know that he and Kamala have a really good relationship, um, basically through his son, because Kamala and Bo, they, you know, they took on banks. They were uh, people are like, how, why are they so close? Kamala and Bo were attorney generals together. And so there were a lot of not just a natural friendship, but they actually worked together. Um, and so, um, you know, I am I'm very, very, very. Uh, I'm pleased with their relationship and somebody can be president on day one. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. Let's go to some questions from the, from the, uh, the audience here. Uh, well, this one is actually for me. Corey Claiborne said the book is back ordered. If I order it from you now, when will I get it? Uh, the book is only temporarily back ordered like a day or so. So uh, I, when I spoke to them earlier, they said it's really a computer glitch and by tomorrow, the, or, I'm not saying you'll get it tomorrow. I'm saying that the, it shouldn't be back. It shouldn't be back stocked after tomorrow. I had the same challenge with my own book. Uh, it says, I would like, uh, Joy Oak said, I would like to ask Bakari what he plans to do professionally in the future, both short term and long term. Now, I know you said anxiety prevents you from thinking too long term. So I, I don't want to put that on you. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I tell people often I'm going to be, um, I am, uh, I'm, I'm going to run for Congress soon, United States Congress soon, um, maybe 2022. Uh, we'll see. Um, you know, my best detail by Jim Clyburn. So we'll see. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about being a dad. You know, I got 17 month old twins, which keep me, I mean, they, I, the reason I look like this is because they, their mama went and got them last night when they were crying. So they slept with us and it was horrible. Mm. We were up at 3.30 trying to put them back. In the <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I enjoy being a father. Um, I want to write more. We're, we're talking about that, writing more books. Um, I want to write a black political book about the politics of the South. Um, covering things like police brutality, covering things like activism, etc. Um, I'm just um, out here just trying to, to be, you know, um, be a change agent and be in spaces. I'm enjoying my job at CNN. I'm enjoying speaking up and speaking out when I can. Um, it, it, I'm doing it all. 
and doing everything I can in the words of the great American poet, um, Christopher Wallace, I'll sleep when I die. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, we have a, a, a viewer, AMD, who says, in your memoir, did you get approval from friends and family who you wrote about for accuracy or discretion? So, yes, um, I got approval. Um, I, um, the accuracy is there. Um, the weird part though, is I did not let them read the book before it was printed. So, um, you know, my sister, for example, is a big character in the book and my sister and brother were talking to me. They were like, you need to let me read it before it was released. I said, well, you know, it's going to be a weird Thanksgiving. Their response was, if you get invited to Thanksgiving. So, fair. Um, you know, they, they're, they're this, you know, yes, uh, we, we made sure, of course, for accuracy, but um, and approval of sharing stories. But, um, um, you know, that that was that was pretty much the extent. Are were you were there any things that you left out because someone said, nah, this this ain't it either because they disagreed with your how, your recollection or because they said it was too much? Nah, I mean, I, I everyone that I went to and that's why it's not like 40. It, what, what we did was I had characters in the book. Right. And pop my father, my mother, um, Jared, um, my partner, Rob, but I don't have 35 characters in the book. No. Like they want to go down this tangent of who they met, who they, who had the locker above them. Um, and so it wasn't like that. And again, this is my story. So it's my I story. didn't know if there was like a, a girlfriend from high school that you, that you wrote in and then, and then you wouldn't checked it and the editor was like, there were there were some things there were some things I did and I mentioned everything but there were some things that weren't necessary to put in there. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly what that means, good brother. I'm gonna keep that moving. <laughs> um, a viewer in D said, "How do you think we can move forward to bring unity am amidst the pandemic that is racism, which is very much prevalent in 2020?" So there are a couple of things. One, um, curing racism is not on black people to do. I want to be extremely clear about that. Two, I have a huge fear that we'll miss this moment. And you're like, why do why do you fear that? Um, because we had 1955 with Emmett Till and her his image, the image that his mother allowed to be shown, it shaped the country, the, and it shaped the conscience of a country in 1955. I remember it was an Ebony magazine. Yeah. Edmund Pettus Bridge for the first time on broadcast TV on um, the evening news that black people were shown getting beaten, dogs, water hoses, um, Charleston massacre, not far from where I'm sitting right now. We have straggly white boy went in and killed my good friend Clemente, which I write about, and eight others during Bible study. And we had, you know, the president saying amazing grace. We had the entire world watching and nothing changed. So I'm not sure if anything will change. Um, but I do believe that it's necessary to have difficult conversations. Everybody don't need to be an activist and everybody don't need to say something. Um, you know, point being like Tiger Woods, like, if you could keep that, the New York Knicks, like, what are you doing? Um, sometimes you can just pick up a book, right? In silence and read. One of the things that we have, and this may sound a little foo-foo, but it's true. One of the things we have is a lack of empathy. Like they're, they're um, was it Little House on the Prairie? You know, that clip that pops up every now and then? When he's like, would you trade places and be a black man? And then the, the, the what's the white guy? In, was it Little House in the Prairie? Am I making that up? Um, I was thinking trading places. What do you do? Was it trading places? When when the old white guy was in the room and he said, and the little black guy, what's his name? I can't remember his name. He asked, somebody will put it in the comments, I'm sure. And he asked, would you be, would you be a Negro? And the white guy thinks about it and he pauses and he walks out the room. And it, it's, it's like, that. I mean, it's would you have an, would you have empathy? Would you be able to put yourself in the, the shoes of others? One of the questions I get a lot is about the quite the conversations I have with my 15 year old daughter. Like, what do you have with your daughter? Like, tell me about those conversations. Todd Bridges. Thank you so much. That's exactly who it was. Um, and it was it was Little House with Todd Bridges. That's that's before my time, brother. It was before my time, too. <laughs> I got IG. The story, it, it popped up. Um, but, you know, people always like, so tell me about what you what you teach your white kid, white people. Tell me about what you teach your your children about how to be alive. And I'm like, that's cool and all. But tell me what you teach your kids about giving my children the benefit of their humanity. I mean, the, tell me, I mean, how are you 
are you empowering are you empowering um are you empowering black folk around you are you um i'm treating them with the respect when i'm not there mm. that those are the questions that we have to ask and those are the lessons that have to be taught absolutely we got a question coming in uh from mona she said can you speak to this moment in time as it relates to history as it relates to global white supremacy and black america's relationship in terms of political leadership as it relates to proximity to the power uh for example uh, the military industrial complex and maybe it, it maybe touch on how uh, on the place of the seemingly dislodging of radical black voice. So I, I, I get the question. So h- how do you see sort of where we are now? Uh, there seems to be less radical, fewer radical black voices at a moment where global white supremacy is, is becoming more and more intense. What does that mean for our leadership class? What does that mean for us? So, I mean, I, I think that the, the 50,000 foot view and the, the really the catchphrase, which I dare not bore you with, is that we've made progress, but we still have yet a ways to go, right? But what we're starting to see is in places like uh, Alabama or Southern black mayors or Mississippi, you're having more and more black elected officials in this country. I think one of the people that she mentioned was Condoleezza Rice being secretary of state. And although we're making progress, it doesn't matter unless we change and alter and deconstruct these systems, right? It's not, it's gonna take more than one black face. It's gonna take more than one person. And so, yeah, we, one of the things that I always tell people is we need people, and I chose to be a part of the system, All right, a lot like Julian, right, to run for office and go into the South Carolina legislature. The same, for me, it was kind of cool because the same state that deemed my father to be an outside agitator now had to deal with me as a legislator. So the first things I did was to file bills to investigate the Orange Room Massacre, to take down a Confederate flag, to raise the minimum wage. Now, that ain't radical to a lot of people, but in South Carolina, no, that's a thing. That's the thing, right? And so trying to change the trajectory and landscape of where we were, and we have to do more of that. And I do think though, over time, and as we're having this conversation, and as we're in this seminal moment, um, we will be able to finally see, as we're talking about policing right now, maybe we can deconstruct this police state that all of us live in and rebuild it in the image and reform of what policing should actually be like. Does defunding uh, play a role in that for you? Oh, of course. But I'm also like, I'm also smart enough to push to not push away activists who believe in defunding. I'm also smart enough to understand that defunding does not mean that we won't have police. I'm also smart enough to understand that defunding means that we're going to spend dollars that police use right now for drones and Humvees and escalation equipment to actually put it in things like mental health, to put it in things like after schools programs, to put it in things like Marion Berry's. Uh, summer work programs, etc. I think that that's what defunding means, and I think that that's an important concept. Someone asked G. Thomas said, "How do we handle all the electoral difficulties at the uh, polls that we've recently seen?" You know, the funny part—not the funny part—you have to laugh at some of this stuff because it's it's just it's, it's harsh. But as we were burying George Floyd yesterday, people were waiting six hours in line to vote. And I couldn't help but to see the connection between the two, right? Mm. And you're burying one man who died at the hands of racial state sanctioned violence. You still have, you know, the systems of oppression and racist systems which prevent us from voting in a timely fashion. And um, and we went on white sides of town, people were able to vote quickly. Um, and so, you know, that's why, you know, it's, that that's difficult, but I'm very proud of the people who waited. Um, and all the only thing I can say to that is as these elections come and as we participate and as we cultivate a new generation of people who understand that democracy is participatory, these things will change and we will elect secretaries of state. People don't even know how important secretaries of state truly are. Secretaries of state govern your election practices, right? Mm-hmm. Court govern your local election practices. These are people who are vital. And we'll make sure that we have good people who look like us, who think like us, who progressive like us, who want to who want to have that change. Sunset eighty nine said, "I am a black woman heading to grad school this fall. Since these protests have begun, I have uh, become very active in protesting and organizing. At this moment, I am no longer motivated to attend school. Any advice?" I mean, my dad dropped out of school to protest. 
I mean, I, I think that there's so much you can do with the degree, but I'm not going to tell you that you can't come back and get it. Um, I want you to understand the value of an education in this country and understand the value for you. Um, but also, I don't quote King a lot because he's been whitewashed, but King was a revolutionary. And people forget that. But And we always get caught up in the rhythm and cadence of I have a dream that one day we shall, but we forget about the most important part of that speech in which he talks about uh, the fierce urgency of now. Mm. And um, this moment is important. And so maybe take less hours and still be in the street to get a little bit of both. It would be my suggestion. Are you hopeful for this country? This country will uh, will be what it's supposed to be? Loaded question. What? Yeah, go ahead. Um, so I refuse to let people take away my hope and faith. Um, and I, I don't want my work to be in vain. I don't want your work to be in vain. And I'm going to continue to work extremely hard, but this country has not proven that it can rise to moments like this. So I'm not sure what the end game or end result of our work will be. I can just tell you, I'm going to try to be on the front lines to make it happen so that my kids have a better America than the one I inherited. I think that's, our, that's our, I think that's our purpose. Wow. Well, thank you for living that purpose and for sharing this time with us and for sharing this book with us, everybody. Uh, the book is called My Vanishing Country. It's a memoir. Uh, you can purchase it by going uh, to the green bar underneath and clicking that little button that says My Vanishing Country and buy it uh, from Uncle Bobby's. Bakari, thanks so much, brother, for your time. Let me just say this, man. Please support the book. Um, just like nobody did well, I got a chance to write. There are other young black people other people of color, other people from the South who want to share their stories. And so um, please give this book a chance. And so other people can, can share their stories as well. Thank you so much, Mark, from the bottom of my heart to the staff at Uncle Bobby's, um, just always being there. I'm so grateful and I will forever owe you one. Thank you, bro. Peace. Thank you.